challenges were always overcoming two things. One was my physical difference in appearance, which created stigma and you know sort of socialization at times from other students, uh, and also the vision impairment. And so when you have albinism, you have a, a significant visual impairment. I'm classified uh, by Western standards as legally blind, which means I have 2200 vision, which is roughly 90% less vision than a fully sighted person. The problem with albinism is that no one recognizes your level of visual impairment. You're not using typically a cane or a white uh, or a guide dog, uh, and you may walk around and conduct yourself as though you're uh, quite sighted, but in fact, a lot of things you can't see. My entire education, I could never see anything written on the blackboard, uh, nothing ever, even if I sat in the front row. So from kindergarten all the way through onto my master's degree, I had to listen carefully, and I had to try and take notes from what I could hear because I could never see what was written on the blackboard. And that one will be uh, that more enough consensus. There'll be a debate about the merits of the motion tomorrow. My biggest Whoever motivator in advocating for the rights of people with albinism around the world is my own journey. Uh, back in 2008, when I heard about my brothers and sisters with albinism being murdered in Tanzania, I thought to myself, I have to do something. I had never been to Africa in my life before, born and raised in Canada. I didn't even know where Tanzania was. But I heard a BBC report that people with albinism were being murdered for their body parts. And I thought to myself, if I lived in Canada and I had to go to bed every night, being afraid I wouldn't wake up in the morning. I didn't know the language, didn't know the culture. But genetically, these people were my brothers and sisters. We have the same DNA. Because albinism is a universal metaphor of unity of humanity. You take someone who's Chinese, somebody who's African, uh, somebody who's Caucasian from Canada, and you put them beside each other and they all have albinism, how do they look? Well, they all look the same. This was the first time in human history ever at the United Nations that our people group had been represented. Women, children, Aboriginal persons, persons of other minority backgrounds had been represented and discussed at the Human Rights Council in Geneva, but our group had never been. So this was breaking new ground. My dreams for people with albinism globally, I have a dream one day that people with albinism will take their rightful place in every level of society, in every way, and that the days of discrimination that they face and live with will one day become a faint memory. It's a dream of complete equality, of complete inclusion. It's where children don't go to school and get called Casper the Ghost. It's where parents that have dark skin don't think their child is a European ghost or a curse on the family because they look different. It's a world where teachers understand that when a child who looks like me walks into the classroom, they're going to need help because they can't see the blackboard. But other than that, they're just as bright as every other kid in the class. And given equal access and equal opportunity to accommodate their vision impairment, they will succeed. In fact, many of the students in our education program in Tanzania academically uh, surpassed their colleagues with albinism. So given the right accommodations, people with albinism have every opportunity. And so my dream is simply a world of complete equality for people with albinism.